different points, but that was pretty much even from like liberal media lawyers on Law and Crime Network, Court TV, other places. Kind of, I caught you know bits and pieces from everybody, and everybody except liberal hardcore liberals were saying not guilty, and and uh, had problems with it. And this just shows you how none of that mattered. That in the Twin, I believe that if they had meaningfully polled the Twin Cities. They would have found, especially after Chauvin, I mean, all the other Chauvin defendants, co-defendants, between this trial and the Chauvin trial, they should poll again. And my guess they'll find is that they can they can actually find an impartial jury somewhere in Minnesota. It just ain't anywhere in the Twin Cities. What, what actually happened with the other uh, Chauvin co-defendants? I, I They're don't waiting I... for jury trial for this summer, okay. I believe. Unbelievable. Um, I mean, it, it's just lynching juries in the Twin Cities. They're proud, liberal lynching juries, you know. Lynching juries are always proud. People have this myth that they felt guilty or they didn't know what they were doing or they, you know, no, they weren't ashamed. Then to kill a mockingbird type cases that happened in the South, they went out and celebrated afterwards. They were proud. I mean, that's why the people are smiling at public lynchings. I mean, they, they don't under, they, these people thought they did God's work uh, lynching this woman who had zero complaints against her until this incident. And because she tried to use lesser force, against a dangerous criminal who is endangering the lives of other officers and other people, uh, she's now looking at uh, 10 plus years in state prison. It, it is, this is, I, I, look, I'm not going back and to by the, the way, film. wasn't even allowed bail to go home for Christmas yeah, Eve that, and that, come back after. That's that. So I, I don't want pills again. I'm going to stop using the analogies. That's where I got a little, a little nauseated. It's not just that the jury came back with what I, what I thought was a wrong decision. Fine. I'm not on the jury. They wanted to I'd get like home to for to... Christmas Eve, so they just made sure they came back with that verdict to hang her. Apparently, I brought up a chat earlier that said that apparently someone on the jury was crying when they read the verdict, so maybe that was the coward who, who uh, caved Folded so they go home. The I don't know. Is. Not going to judge. A lot of them are. I, I, I have no problem judging. I, I'm not. Well, I, I'm, I'm a, the biggest believer in jury trials in the world, but I'm not one of those people that says, oh, you did a great job, jury. Every well, time so, they come back. I'm not but one that's of what, That's where I'm going to get to the judge. You get the judge. The soft-spoken judge, soft, soothing, ASMR-speaking judge who refers to them as heroes. So, well, you know what the problem is? This That, to me, reads as an affirmation by the judge of the decision. And if, I'm, if I want to look at a judge, she might be doing the sentencing. I don't want the judge affirming the decision. I want the judge neutrally assessing the decision. Or how about this, ignoring it? You did your job. Thank you very much. Go home. You're heroes. Your heroes for convicting her. What does that empower the judge to do, Robert? Does the judge sentence? Yes. Yeah. The, the, this judge okay. will determine the sentencing, and and I mean the idea that she couldn't extend bail through Christmas at least. Oh, well, that, well, that's just well, not. That was hogwash. Uh, we're gonna get there it in shows a second. how we're political gonna... it was. She was like, "Oh, I'm not going to do anything different because the prosecutor said, don't treat this like any other case." Name the other case that this compares to. Name the cop that's been on the patrol for 20 plus years, never committed a single violation or lead to a single complaint who's been criminally prosecuted for this kind of case. This kind of case wouldn't be prosecuted in 90 percent of America. The I, only I, thing I would criticize the defense for is not being more aggressive. And when you have a political case like this, there's a tendency of defense lawyers to want to not talk about the elephant in the room. You have to force it right onto the bench because it's your only shot. Because the, the predilection of the judge in a political case like this is to show how strong you are and how impartial you are by hammering the authorities and so on and so forth. You have to push back against that or you're gonna, your client's going to get hammered. But it was just, particularly just, brutal that they came back and she was sent to custody. So she, on Christmas Eve, was sent to jail on Christmas Eve. People have to appreciate that. The judge doesn't just say thank you for your verdict. You are heroes. She refers to the jury that just convicted this woman as heroes. And then the defense moves to have her uh, released on bail pending the sentencing and their appeal. They have a robust appeal from you'll get into the robust appeal in a second. But you have the judge who's in charge of sentencing, referring to the convicting jury as heroes. What do you think that what, what does any reasonable person think that means for sentencing? Yeah, but. So she'll, that, she'll go that, high, is my prediction. She'll yeah, go that, over that, the seven that, years that, normal. That 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 pissed me. That made me nauseous. It's like, oh, all right, thanks for you know. It, I I don't use the word circle jerk often. I'm going to use it now. That was like, hey, jury, thanks for giving me what I need. You're heroes, and I'm going to roast this person. And then the, and then the defense says, let her go. She's got a hundred thousand dollar bail. She's got family in Minnesota. She's she's not a flight risk. She's not going anywhere. Uh, 
and, and let her go home for Christmas. And the judge says, I can't treat this case any differently than any other case. When what she's basically saying is, I'm going to treat this case differently than every other case. Or, but I mean, what, what are the criteria for allowing um, a, a, a convicted criminal to go home? Like, I, I appreciate it. Well, it, it used to be much more robust because, you know, you have a right of appeal. So the, the, it used to be if you have good legal arguments on appeal that you would be granted bail pending appeal when you know, there's, she's not a flight risk. Um, and, and that's it. Yeah, because the only interest they have in you serving your punishment is ma- in bail is securing, making sure you ultimately serve the punishment, the sentence given out. The problem is there's a substantial risk when there's an appeal that someone will be punished who is later found not guilty on appeal that they, for whatever reason. Or the sentence is set aside. So the way that's supposed to be balanced is in favor of individual liberty. Uh, unless the person's a serious risk of flight, at this point you can sometimes consider a threat to the community. I've always had a problem with that. Well, but uh, so post conviction, there's more grounds for that. But I, I'm still not in favor of that because that opens up a can of worms. But well, I was gonna say, he was flight. not a threat to the community, and that was acknowledged. So here you had someone that was solely there was no risk of flight. There was no. It was solely hey, uh, convicted in other cases, we routinely deny them bail. Because we've become customary to it. And without, you know, you know what word did not come out of the judge's mouth? The Constitution. No, not, not even a reference to it. Uh, and that's the problem. I mean, I've, I've actually I had a federal judge uh, look at me when I raised the constitutional objections of the Constitution. Constitu- I was like, am I in federal court or not? Yes, the Constitution. That's why, what do you think the Eighth Amendment says? Uh, and yet that's where we're at in this country. That uh, since the Bail Reform Act of 1986, in a lot of state analog versions, courts have grown accustomed to denying people bail. Now, we've had other bail reform acts that maybe were too liberal uh, in who they released, but I'm, I'm, I'm on that side, even though my conservative friends are not. Uh, I, I'm going to side with individual liberty, even at the expense or risk of the public, commu- public good, because I think the better public good is individual liberty in the end. But that's uh, not a consistent. But, but the left, where's the left here? Like the left complains about misuse and abuse of bail. This is an example of misuse and abuse of bail as punishment, as disguised punishment. I mean, I mean, I've, I've been critical of the Glenn Maxwell bail conditions because they're punishment in disguise. People can't convince me they're anything more than that and anything other than that. And that's not allowed until she's been criminally convicted constitutionally. And I have – well, so the issue is going to be not allowed until she's been – or they have been criminally convicted. And then Kim Potter has been criminally convicted, so why let her out? Pending because she has a right of appeal and that conviction may be set aside. So unless she's a danger to the imminent danger to the community or an imminent risk of flight that cannot be uh, protected against without conditions of release, including she's not a risk of either one of those things. Uh, so the I mean, if she was going to flee, she would have fled a long time ago. So, you know, this is a lifelong member of the community. Now, the question will be, will the police union that paid for her defense also pay for her appeal? They refuse to do so in the case of Derek Chauvin. She may be a little different, so maybe they will in her case, but otherwise she has problems of mounting the legal defense on appeal because she doesn't have the means to raise money for herself. Uh, If the union won't pay it, she doesn't have it, I don't think, herself. And on top of that, she'll be in custody this whole time Uh, and probably in isolation because of her being a former police officer. What? uh, When do we find that out? Like, How do we find out whether or not she has the means to pay? If she asks to go, uh, uh, you know, in some form of uh, ask for a public uh, defender or someone else be appointed for her because she doesn't have the uh, means to pay, that would be the sign of that. And it's not always clear she can get that on appeal in Minnesota. At least I know Chauvin looked like he was not able to. So now they yeah, disputed and, whether or not he really had the means, is my recollection. And in fairness to Chauvin, this is, you know, Chauvin's was a, a – if there's political hot potatoes, Chauvin's was more of a political hot potato than Potter. Potter's yeah, and Chauvin didn't have a lot of support within the police, uh, or not nearly as much as she did. She was a former police union, you know, personnel leader and so forth. So I just want to bring this up. If she needs it, I'm willing to donate. If she needs it and we find out, we will make it loud and clear, known to everybody. I think she has a very robust appeal because the trial, as, uh, as was pointed out repeatedly by Andrew Bronca, Law of Self-Defense, the judge repeatedly uh, refused to define clearly for the jury what recklessness meant criminally. And that, I think, did open up the door for a reversal. And remember, there's already been a reversal in a prior police shooting case in Minnesota by the Minnesota Supreme Court on correlated kind of issues. Uh, Chauvin has some of those same issues. 
uh, pendant, and she does too, because they, they refused to, they were more committed to getting a conviction than they were clearly defining the law in a limited constitutional way. Some say that they were using these cases to expand and loosen the law so that the state has more power rather than less, and that makes it particularly concerning for everybody beyond just Kim Potter. All right, well, we're going to see where that goes. When the sentencing, I think they scheduled it for like March, right? It was, it was mid-March? I believe so because they wanted time to do all the briefing because the state wants to do aggravating factors, the defense wants to do departing factors. And so, uh, but there's already political pressure on this judge to go high. And given her refusal to define recklessness, given her praise of the jury, given her imprisonment, uh, on Christmas Eve, that's not the sign of a judge. I don't think any judge has the political courage in the Twin Cities to stand up against the current political environment. And and that's I, I, I don't, I don't care about Christmas per se, but the idea that this individual, 26 years on the force, not a blemish on her record, was by all accounts defending her brethren, made a bona fide mistake, even if you thought it was negligent, whatever. No, you, you, you would not put her out on bail where she has no chance of leave, fleeing any more than she did pending the trial. But no, can't, can't do that for the next three months. Stick her straight in jail. No good night. No hug to her husband. It's terrible. Um, so I mean, we'll in federal court, through. repeatedly, after conviction, your, your, your bail terms are continued until sentencing. And even then, you're allowed to self-report frequently. So the idea that this is unheard of is simply not the case. Uh, maybe in Minnesota they've grown accustomed to denying people bail pending appeal, but that's not what the that's not the custom across the country, nor is it what should be the custom constitutionally. I mean, there's Supreme Court justices that have required bail for people that were convicted of foreign arms dealing. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, and with connections around the world where we're not even U.S. citizens, the kind of people who are high risk flight risk. And, they, and the uh, people like Justice Black and Douglas demanded their release pending trial. So because that was back when we cared about the Eighth Amendment. We just don't care about it much, much these days. And liberals are temporary, you know, only care about it when it serves their, uh, their political interest. When it doesn't, they're suddenly mute about it. All right, well, I guess yeah. the, uh, the, other, the other pending, pending trial. I mean, Ghislaine Maxwell is it's still amazing. deliberate. Kim Potter goes to verdict almost right away. And in my view... <laughs> A, the wrong verdict. It's like Kim Potter's the one. There's three women up for trial uh, at the same time. Kim Potter, Elizabeth Holmes, and Ghislaine Maxwell. And Potter's the one you rush to convict on? Not Ghislaine Maxwell? Not uh, Elizabeth Holmes? What does that so, tell you about where juries are these days in America? G- Ghislaine Maxwell is still up in the air, right? There, there's been nothing. Yes, same with Elizabeth and- Holmes. I mean, they've been going four days, five days, however many days it is. Ghislaine Maxwell or- trial, they demanded a bunch more evidence today. Uh, demanded more clarity on certain issues. The uh, in the Elizabeth Holmes case, they've demanded certain things be read back to them. So there's clearly split juries in all these ca- in both of these cases. And the only question is, which way is it? Is it is it ten to eleven one conviction? Is it ten to eleven one acquittal? Is it six six? Is it you know we we don't know. But the nature of the questions and the length of deliberations would strongly suggest that there's at least a few people on there who think uh, Elizabeth Holmes is not guilty. And you think Elaine Maxwell is not guilty. Well, and, and, and I, I, it's probably the same kind of juror who would have said guilty in the case of Kim Potter. I say this not as a joke. I say this because The Simpsons has been a very accurate predictor of the future and very informative to me. When Homer was on the jury and they said, if you can't come to a verdict, you get to stay at a hotel and you get dinner. He's like, I get a free meal and a free hotel. I, is, there any, is there any distinction between... The, uh, you know, the conditions for Kim Potter, the conditions for Ghislaine Maxwell and the conditions for the jury for Elizabeth uh, Holmes that might make it less unpleasant to deliberate for an extended period of time. Is there any? No, nothing that no. we know. Not that I know of. I mean, I think in the Potter case, I think they were sequestered once it was jury deliberation time. So that can often accelerate jury decision making because they don't like. You most jurors don't like that, other than your, your, you know, your Mr. Simpson, um, you know, who famous uh, Homer also famously said, you know, he always got off jury duty just by saying he hates all people of all other races. <laughs> pretend, uh, pretend you're prejudiced against all races. I mean, it's a great way to do it. Oh man. Okay, so so Potter, I, I, look, Potter, we feel the same way. Potter, I don't know of one lawyer, one of the lawyers in the YouTube lawyer community, 
who agrees with the verdict? I mean, yeah, Brody, I, know, I mean, I know Rob, some prominent liberal lawyers who, uh, but not within the, with now within the uh, YouTube or U Law or Law Tube, whatever it's called these days, community. I didn't know anybody within that community, not Nate or other people, who thought that Kim Potter was guilty. But the but there were prominent liberal lawyers in the media who thought Kim Potter was guilty. But even there, there was a split. About half of them thought not guilty, half thought guilty. So that gives you an idea for how bad that jury pool is. And that case is a real classic example that if you had no political prejudice coming in and watch the jury, you would or watch the trial. You would have, you know, most people would have guessed not guilty and would have voted not guilty. And it's just a reminder that jurors carry their baggage with them into that jury room and they make decisions uh, with or without you. Uh, regardless of evidence that it's a lot of it's theater and uh, that's unfortunately been reinforced and frankly reinforced now in the Elizabeth Holmes and Ghislaine Maxwell trial because I'm you know I think both of these were straightforward convictions based on the evidence presented Ghislaine Maxwell they took unnecessary if Maureen Comey the only upside to Ghislaine Maxwell getting acquitted was it should be the end of Maureen Comey's career because they deliberately chose to dramatically limit the amount of evidence presented and we're now we're witnessing the negative effects of that. I don't think ultimately it will result in anything but some form of convictions, maybe split verdicts, but some form of convictions. Also, Ghislaine Maxwell still faces perjury trial. So it's not clear she would either get out or, uh, but she would, but the sentencing risk would go way down on the perjury charges compared to what she faces on these. And it would be the most, maybe the most embarrassing verdict in a high profile case, you know, since a case that I've done. Uh, that the U.S. Department of Justice, for the U.S. Justice Department, because that was a state, O.J. was a state prosecution. I don't know of a higher profile loss than losing this at the U.S. federal level or losing the Holmes case. Either one of those would be the biggest high profile federal losses I can remember in a long time. Someone said, what, what did Legal Eagle think of the conviction in Potter? I don't I don't know that he's made any public statement about it. Uh, what was the Robert, what was the other biggest conviction? What the other biggest screw up? It was. Leading up to O.J. Simpson, it was the prosecutor who – oh, Michael, Michael Jackson, I think we, we had talked about that a while back. Well, that, 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 that was a deserved acquittals too. Well, Michael well, Jackson they, and O.J. Simpson are innocent, but we'll be breaking down the O.J. case after the new year with the behavior panel uh, debating it in full. We just have to schedule it with those uh, good gentlemen. And we, we need to get Dershowitz in if Dershowitz is, is still game to do it. We get Dershowitz in. I, I don't know what he can talk be, about. Wouldn't he be heavily limited? And what he could say, because OJ is still alive, so that he couldn't talk about anything that'd be attorney-client privilege. You know what? I retract the offer for uh, for Dershowitz. Besides which, yeah, never mind. Dershowitz um, also said he thought the Kim Potter tri- verdict was at, uh, was a legal outrage, and that well, she has very robust appeal issues. I, I, I think it's, I, look, I I think it's an outrage just because I appreciate she made a mistake. I appreciate some people who have never been in that position say it's an unforgivable mistake. Unforgivable versus costing you civilly versus criminal are three very different things, and no doubt. I think people say, oh, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a sniper. I've played uh, Call of Duty. I, 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 you know, I'm great. I always know the difference between a one-pound taser and a one, two-point-one-pound Glock. Is it, everybody loves playing backseat driver, Monday morning quarterback, but she made a mistake. Her reaction was one of someone who made a mistake, who did not do what she meant to do. It was pedal confusion. And I don't know how they got to that condition. And I, and I, I think the public policy impact of this historically has been cops start withdrawing from anything that could get confrontational. Yeah. Some people welcome that because they think cops are too eager to be confrontational. Historically, that tends not to be politically popular over time because it leads to spikes in crime. Because the, the, the people they avoid are not your low-risk people. They avoid your high-risk people. Uh, your Dwayne Wrights, your, your people with long rap sheets, your guys with, you know, failure to appear, gun charges, assault charge, this charge, you know, stuff you don't want to get near. And, and what, well, what, in fact, we have seen over the last year in major cities where there has been major either lower police forces, lower police force spending, or just cops withdrawing from high risk zones is dramatic spikes in crime in the most dangerous crime around. I think that's what's probably going to be coming that would be part one part two is if you're a cop with an iq over 60 uh you should get the heck out of any major urban center if you can i mean there's some that can't for seniority and other reasons for family connections etc but i think anybody that's looking at starting a career you're nuts to start your career in a liberal city because you will be made a scapegoat the moment it's convenient to make you a scapegoat 
Um, and I think that's a second, uh, the other likely reality that's coming. Now, Ben Crump will, you know, shake out his chump of change out of this case, chunk of change, uh, 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 you know, like he has in other cases. So that, that, that grift will go on grifting. Um, but the, I don't think it has positive public policy impacts in the way that may, even some people that uh, think it might, that say, well, now cops will be more resist. Or well, the other third thing is the point you made and other people have made, which is they're going to say, you know what, screw using a taser. You know, the, even having it available is seen as a problem. I'm just next time I just pull the gun and that's it. And, and the, not only that, they'll accelerate the violence early. A lot of people will look at this as a training, in, as a training a video. And what they'll say is if the first cop had been a lot more violent and physical, this never excel it escalates like it does. And yeah. so on the history of this happening, we had a, a historical example of this late 1960s. A lot of laws got put in place to restrain cops justifiably, I would add, because cops were a lot worse in the 50s than they are today. Um, they were beating confessions out of people on a routine basis. So the uh, but there was a probably an overreaction by courts. And that led to uh, cops withdrawing and crime going haywire. And the response was by the 80s, people are willing to just lock people up and throw away the key by the 90s. And so people, the liberals who think this is a great ruling are probably going to rue the day that this – she is not your – Derek Chauvin is your poster boy for going after him. Even though I have problems with that verdict, Derek Chauvin was a deeply politically unpopular guy who had a long litany of complaints against him. She was someone who everybody in the police force loved who had zero complaints against her. When you make her the poster boy or poster girl of your campaign, you're likely getting into political territory that will not last well for you over time. And that was the question. Has has anyone actually resigned? Has there been any impact in Minnesota Twin Cities or? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it depends on whether they would want to make that public or not. Probably they wouldn't want to make it public. Maybe some officers would. But the uh, I mean, at this point, everybody in the Twin Cities knew the score. I mean, I think they were just kind of naive, uh, but seeing her get convicted will probably shock a few. Um, I mean, the uh, but, uh, you know, I, w- that, it, it depends on the – a lot of cops think none of this will ever happen to them. Uh, I've, met, I've run into cops that are that way. It's like it was the response to the truck driver case. It was fascinating. Yeah. Some truck drivers very protective of them. Some truck drivers very judgmental of them. Some were like, hey, I, I, you know, part of the deal is I, got, I take myself out. I, I, I'm, I'm a truck driver. I got a higher duty and a higher obligation to people. Uh, others are, you know, don't see it that way. And so it, it's interesting. And I think cops well, react well, what, what the same I, way. A fair number of cops, I think, are in denial about what's happening political, that this will not stop, that, 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 that they, they will keep adding on these kind of charges if there's a racial element in particular in these liberal cities. What I love with the truck driver is like it was like, oh, yeah, I would have taken myself out. I don't think the truck driver did what he did because he thought it was going to preserve his own life. I just think he panicked. It's like yeah, he didn't think he was had, had any people. better chance. Yeah. He didn't have any better chances of survival careening into trucks than he did careening off the road. So and, you know, bringing this one up, uh, the problem most people have with the Potter case is that they can't understand that once adrenaline sets in, you really aren't thinking about the weight that's in your hands. You're just reacting. I've been in three serious car accidents in my life. I've been at fault for all of them. You have no idea what's going on. It takes you days to recognize what happened. Potter, who's, you know, she's, all she wanted to do was protect and serve. Yes, she pulled the wrong weapon. She, what, it was on her dominant. I don't care. My theory is, okay, well, they've set the precedent now that if you are violently resisting arrest, you're not taking your own life into your hands. You are placing the responsibility for your well-being in the hands of the arresting officers. And that's basically to say you can do whatever you want. And if you get hurt, it's their fault if they don't react perfectly. And that's a very that's a very dangerous precedent. It's a very dangerous logical precedent. And in civilly, she was always going to be held responsible and the city was always going to write a big check. The question is whether she was criminally culpable. Did she uh, act with it? Did she really think this was a likely outcome of what she did? And I didn't see enough evidence to say that she did. Definitely not evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, and, and down skated says trucker of 10 years. Almost none of us are protesting the verdict. The ones stopped, the ones stopped were because of dangerous high winds. He failed his job and he had every chance to stop, but chose to kept going down skated. I'm not going to I'm not going to contradict you. I don't know what you know versus what he knew when he says he chose to kept going to keep going. 
we might be getting into reading minds. Shows yeah, or he TV? denies it. And the flip side is there's millions of truck drivers that have, or millions of people that say they're truck drivers that have signed petitions for his commutation. So, but I have heard that again. I get really strong polarized reactions from truck drivers. Yeah, some are very protective of him and say that you know what they're expecting of him is very is unreasonable, and some are like, "Hey, we're truck drivers. We hold ourselves out to the highest standard. Anything you do, you, you is on you." That and, and I understand that. Uh, it's it's the fascinating thing with jurors. It's like with my favorite question: How to pick a jury? Is I ask you know, young lawyers, uh, "You're if you are the prosecutor." in a case, in a rape case, uh, and the only thing you know is age and gender, who do you pick on the jury? And most people think you pick someone on the jury that looks like the victim, age-wise and gender-wise. That, that's actually the worst possible juror uh, in a rape case. The best type of juror is an older man, and the reason is because the older man sees his daughter on trial, particularly if he has a daughter. Uh, and so he judges the guy, says he should have done this, should have done this, should have done this. The young woman says, this is never going to happen to me. And the way this is never going to happen to me is I'm different from her like this, like this, like this, like this. And the survival instinct is strong. And that's what you're seeing even truck drivers. Some truck drivers who think this can never happen to me because I'm a much better truck driver than this person. And I take responsibility. Other truck drivers say this can absolutely happen to me. And thus I have problems with how harshly this individual is being judged. And that's what you're often seeing reflected in the jury verdict. But uh, we're seeing some very interesting and maybe we'll get a, 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 you know, something before New Year's in the Glenn Maxwell trial and uh, the Elizabeth Holmes trial. But I'll tell you, if Kim Potter is the only one that goes to prison of those three, we got some yeah. problems in our trial system. Uh, and I think we can agree with that. And truck driver probably never has never seen a runaway ramp or used a Jake break. Uh, that would that would be negligence on the employer's behalf, and then maybe on his. But oh, Lookout Mountain, that's uh, that's near me. I just went to Lookout Mountain a few weeks ago. He not only had the runaway truck ramp, but an uphill slope and oh, wet that grass. Be, that must be the one in Colorado. There's a Lookout Mountain here in Chattanooga. No, I mean, and I get it. Some other people have told me that they said they've looked at it and thought he definitely could have done much more and better. Yeah. My problem right, well, uh, wasn't the facts of that case. My problem was the way the prosecutor was interpreting the law. Vehicular that, manslaughter. Ve oh, it's vehicular homicide. It's not yeah. just... Uh, and saying overtly, your duty is to kill yourself. And if you don't, you've committed ve vehicular manslaughter. Imposing that duty is a whole different animal. And I have problems with that as a, as a legal theory. Because that goes dangerous places. Once the state can lock you up because they say that you have an affirmative duty and obligation to kill yourself rather than risk anyone else's life. Think about our current situation pandemic wise and where they might take that. Uh, so people should be real hesitant to embrace those kind of legal theories, even if they think morally and factually what that driver did was wrong and was worthy of the sentence he got. Um, the not a lot of people think a hundred plus years is a worthy sentence, but put that putting that aside, that was my big problem with the case is the theory that the state was using the case to propagate. All right. Now, with that said, Robert, before you end, uh, start the new week with a white pill moment or some white pill stuff. Do we have a sidebar this Wednesday? Uh, not as of yet. No. Okay. I, so stay uh, tuned. I may be in transit. May not be. I don't know yet. Okay. And, and I may, uh, if I can, I'll do one. There may be other issues that we might, <laughs> we might discuss later on in time, people. Uh, but Robert, white pill, give us some optimism so that we do not get black pilled by what we've been seeing. And then, uh, you know, a little New Year's wish, but go run with it. Sure. So the uh, uh, I mean, uh, I think the best you know, white pill or the best uh, good news that's I think coming is the U.S. Supreme Court will say the federal government does not have the power in the way that the Biden administration at least has utilized it to mandate vaccines on the uh, whole population. And so I think that that will be the big, big way. It'll be one of the biggest rulings in the history of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and I believe they are going to rule that within the coming weeks. So that's the biggest upside. Okay, well, that's good enough. We'll see what we can do for Wednesday. I don't know why. I don't know what day of the week it is anymore. I don't know what date it is. I just know that it's not New Year's yet. It's the 27th, correct, today? Um, yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's Monday, December okay, so 27th. We're going to do something. Robert, if you can't make it for Wednesday, I'll do something fun. We'll make something happen for Wednesday. I don't know when New Year's is, but uh, the world has melded into one long, very long Canadian day. Uh, Robert Sicker, I think almost it's Saturday. I think New Year's is Saturday. Yeah, no, 
Yeah, it's Saturday because my January 3rd trial for the Dustin Heist Don Lemon case has been postponed uh, because we were given a right to a jury trial rather than it be a bench trial. The bench trial I'm was saying, January 3rd. So I asked you for a white pill moment a second ago, Robert. You did not say this. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> the thing, yeah. yeah, we will get a jury trial in the Don Lemon case. Uh, I represent so, Dustin Heist against Don Lemon. And it's not going to be broadcast. It's federal, correct? Yeah, so, it's federal court. So, yeah. so maybe Matt Lee will step in and watch a little bit. Well, but maybe I'm going to come down and watch a oh, little bit. Oh, yeah. But, oh, yes. Okay, no promises, people. I've got family obligations and dogs. But um, so it, now that it's been a jury, what does that mean? Like, when do they decide? they got to well, do the jury. The court will then decide when is convenient for a jury trial. Okay. So I would assume so, sometime in March would be my guess. Well, that'll, the, we'll, we'll get there, and maybe the world will be free by March. But with that said, people, Robert, stick around. Wednesday, we're going to have a sidebar or a live stream regardless. Sunday, I guess we'll do we'll do a New Year's Day su- live stream. It'll be great. It'll be the day. Yeah, it's January 2nd, so it'll be the day after New Year's. Okay, awesome. We're going to do it. Everyone in the chat, thank you for everything. Thank you for the ch- super chats, the comments, the support, everything. Merry Christmas. We will see each other before, but Happy New Year. Um, I'm going to just going to make sure I can log out while we do this, but that's it. Enjoy everything that's coming, people, and Happy New Year. Mr. Chairman, a minute ago, uh, Senator Whitehouse asked you if any of your views on guns are out of step with the majority of the American people. Um, the AR-15 AR is one of, if not the most popular rifle in America. It's not a machine gun. It's a rifle. Uh, your public position is that you want to ban AR-15s. Is that correct? Senator, uh, thank you for the question, and thank you for our visit yesterday and offering me a Dr. Pepper. It made me reminisce about my time in Central Texas. But now to your uh, question. Uh, with respect to the AR-15, on uh, I support uh, a, a ban as um, as has been presented um, in uh, a Senate bill uh, and supported by the president. Um, the AR-15 is a gun I was issued on ATF's SWAT team, and it's a particularly lethal weapon, um, and regulating it as other particularly lethal weapons um, I have advocated for. Um, as ATF director, if I'm confirmed, I would simply enforce the laws and the books. And right now, uh, there is no such uh, ban on those guns. So you want to ban the most popular rifle in America. Uh, a minute ago, there is a Senate bill. Senator Feinstein had a bill uh, to ban some 2,000 specified rifles and, and other firearms in her bill. In 2013, the Democrats had a majority in the Senate. It was the Harry Reid Senate. And we voted on the Senate floor on Senator Feinstein's so-called assault weapon ban. Do you know how many senators voted for it? No, I do not. Forty. Sixty voted against it. So in a Democratic Senate, a supermajority voted against a ban. Now, part of the reason they voted against the ban, as you're aware, is during the Clinton administration, there was a ban in effect. The Department of Justice studied the effect of that law and discovered that it had no measurable impact on violent crime. Is that right? Senator, um, I did enforce this law for 10 years as an ATF agent. Um, I'm unfamiliar with um, the study that you you are pointing out, and I apologize for that. Well, when you and I met in my office last night and discussed it, I asked if there were any data to suggest that the ban was effective. And, and what you said in the office is you, you were not aware of any data that the data was, I think, mixed is the term you used. Yeah, yes, Senator. Um, what I said to you I, yesterday, you've accurately stated it. Um, I, I think it was mixed, which, um, you know, I stand by that remark. And I think my recollection is that uh, evidence was shown that the limitation on magazine size had an impact. I also believe that later studies showed that the use of assault weapons in mass shootings had declined during that period. Um, but, uh, you know, that that's how I would like to characterize my views on that. So you also said when you and I talked yesterday in the office that Senator Feinstein's bill, which a supermajority of senators voted against in a Democratic Senate, 
You said that bill didn't go far enough and you wanted an even broader ban to ban. You, you said it didn't go far enough. Is that right? Um, Senator, thanks for that question and the ability to, to clarify. What I did say is that Senator Feinstein's bill uh, did not um, address uh, those firearms um, that are currently in the possession of Americans. And then I did share with you my view as an advocate, which would be quite different than someone actually enforcing the law in the books, that those firearms could be treated uh, uh, under the NFA and regulated that way, which would deal with those currently in the possession of Americans. So when you say it didn't go far enough, you mean that you don't just want to ban the manufacturer of those rifles. You don't just want to make it illegal to sell those rifles, but you want to actively have government go after the people who currently possess firearms. And if they don't register and submit to all of the onerous restrictions of the National Firearms Act, presumably confiscate their weapons. Senator, um, what I've said publicly is that uh, as an advocate, uh, I prefer a system where the AR-15 um, and other assault weapons are regulated under the National Firearms Act. Uh, let me sh shift to Ms. Jaddo. Um, you and I also had a presentation this week. Is there so-called birth tourism to be a problem? Thank you, Senator. Thank you, uh, um, and thank you for taking the time to meet with me yesterday. I really appreciated that. Um, yeah, uh, we, we did have a quite fruitful discussion on that issue. And I believe we ended with the thought that we need to collect some information and the data is not there. Um, I also noted that as a mother and as someone who's been through quite a difficult delivery, um, the incredible interest in protecting the health of a mother, the health of a new baby, and ensuring that we could do the best we can uh, so that women and their babies are protected. Ms. Jetta, with all respect, I don't find that answer remotely credible. And you said in my office you didn't consider an eight-month pregnant or nine-month pregnant woman getting a tourist visa to come to America to have a child on American soil so that child is an American citizen that you didn't consider it an abuse of our laws. It's an obvious and transparent abuse of the laws. Uh, I will point out last December, federal prosecutors indicted six people running a birth tourism operation in Long Island where a Turkish woman would pay between $7,500 and $10,000 to travel to New York on tourist visas to give birth and return to Turkey with American citizen babies. And in 2019, the New York Times referred to the birth tourism industry as, quote, thriving. Is it your position that this doesn't occur, that the New York Times was wrong, that there's not a blatant abuse of, uh, of our immigration system? To the extent that anybody is committing fraud or assisting in anybody committing fraud or misrepresentation, that has not only makes someone inadmissible to the United States, but also there are criminal penalties. And I understand, I'm not familiar with the case you just mentioned, but I'm familiar with other ones that um, a sister agency inside the Department of Homeland Security in the past um, 